Hello everyone, today we talk about the Dimanche de Bouvin. Um, the importance, the relevance, the, the incredible significance of the French victory uh, at Bouvin on uh, July the 27th, 1214. Um, in, in general, right, we made a video about the Battle of Bouvin, the, the, the tactical uh, kind. Um, and I will have to re-upload it because of, of the pictures, but it's there, you can listen to, to the whole thing, it's like two hours and a half long. And in there I also explain a bit what the, the political and strategic background was, so if you're interested just for an introduction and to know what, what actually happened in the battle, there I, I explain it extensively. But it, it, it's like, I don't know, it's like Courtre right less than one century after that seems like uh, an entire era um, in distance right that that marked history of warfare right not just european one but properly let's say in as much as of course the west would eventually come to to to, to dominate and to expand where well, these were defining moments in the Probably from a moral point of view, right? Uh, von Clausewitz is very spot on in this, that the consequences of these battles, as, as modest as they were from a strictly military point of view, and this is very important to stress, had an enormous moral impact uh, at the time. In the case of Bouvin, we stick to Bouvin, not Courtrait or other battles for, for that matter, uh, had mostly in deeply, uh, you know, relevant political consequences a bit that weren't to be seen in the very moment right uh, in, in in very aftermath of of the of the french victory over the anglo-german uh, coalition um, but that would effectively change the the single most important uh, dynamics in medieval europe right in in france in england in germany in italy uh, all together right to to mold in a way the the world that by the 13th century would have mm, peaked right in terms of medieval civilization and fundamentally consolidated in spite of the subsequent contraction certain trends certain realities certain cultures right this is this is important to understand for France first first of all right this video is dedicated in a sense to French history as such uh, because of the this, uh, the, the, the the French success as as a broader model, right? We could call feudal in its truest sense, at least by by relative standards, in, in embodied by the Kingdom of France, that exactly under Philip the Second Augustus. By the way, switches in 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 name properly from Kingdom of the Western Franks to kingdom of france a royaume de france um which was to to essentially um re to create in in a sense literally the the france that we understand in modern terms not because the the premises for it hadn't quite existed but you know it, it was not meant to happen in many ways we often give for granted how how often French history could go astray in spite of the the, the mass of the country and its and its relative homogeneity at least in in, in the two main chunks and therefore the, the policy of consolidation and and um, and rise especially of the French monarchy as essentially the the greatest power in Europe um, and you know that French history has these ups and downs. It's like, you know, the, the Merovingians and then, you know, their decline, then the Carolingians and their decline, then the, the Capetians that managed to merge from the, the central centers in the Middle Ages and the Bouvin marks the, this definitive rise, and then the Hundred Years' War, and then the reconsolidation of France in, by in the second half of the 15th century, and then its expansion with the wars of Italy, and then, again, its contraction with the uh, confessional clashes between the end of the uh, 16th and the beginning of the 17th century, then it's, you know, further reconsolidation with Louis XIV in spite of the Fronde. So this kind of important mass movements that the France had already had, for example, during the Hundred Years War, the Jacquerie, that it, it's this enormous demographic and agricultural basin that 
when things start to go wrong, right, starts moving enormous amount of forces. Louis XIV and what he consolidated, and at the end of the same century that he died, the French Revolution that shatters at that point the entire Western civilization, the creation of the nation state that France from from there on embodies in its uh, greatest tradition that many other countries in Europe civil law fundamentally adopt as a model uh, and, and etc etc various revolutions in the 19th century and then again the, the important uh, troubles also in the in the 20th century right uh, France did risk to go to a revolution so by by uh, in the second half of the 20th at some point but let's say it's it's a process which um, naturally reflects the also the the great um, development of the same French state and therefore the uh, the, the structural uh, dynamics that that uh, affected them also the the rise of, of France in during the 13th century is a sort of not quite hegemonic but fundamentally dominating power mo most of Europe through through its own uh, um, dynastic acquisitions um, we have talked about this many times. Well, this is born now, right? Up to that point, the Kingdom of France has, you know, had maintained this this unity in the sense that the the, f the formality of the Kingdom of France was defined since mm, Carolingian times, right? The South had escaped uh, the northern control because fundamentally the 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 Capetians, as they were emerging, just as in their royal domain, controlled a very modest portion of uh, northeastern France, fundamentally other things scattered around, but fundamentally it was the Ile de France and that's it, right? And um and naturally Bouvine marks this this final struggle essentially against French vassals, as the the Angevins as you know, French vassals but also kings of England were uh were embodying themselves, right? And in fact, up to this point, and that's the consequence also for, for England that is relevant properly, the, the Anglicization of the of the English monarchy as such, and the, after after Bovine and this massive re reconquest and extension, at least, of of the uh, Capetian power over the the formerly held, uh, the formerly, let's say, English, let's say in these terms, but were still French, fundamentally, held French territories. In fact, the English barons actually were much more, you know, uh, eager to, to to be in France, to live in France, where their their origins fundamentally were, and you know, they're rather than in England, where there were richer places, they had kind of greater political um, room for that matter. So today we can't even go in detail in all the consequences that. I mean, the Magna Carta and the various other constitutions that were issued in England in the relation. In the negotiation with with the with the barons that were you know uh, coming back in power after the the defeat of John um, uh, of John of England uh, in, in in this big you know this somebody would say grand strategy but you know there is no such thing like any type of strategy strategy is strategy right it's just the, the enormous effort that up to that point not just with John but with Richard as well had been done to and actually going pretty close um, to the, uh, the the overthrowing of the Capetians, right, which is often given for granted at the same time, right, never as close of it since we know how how uh, you know, close, right, a, a, another outcome is always uh, in, in every military and political situation uh, there, there was nothing let's say, deterministic, again, about uh, Bovine. It's just a model that triumphs, right? It could have gone otherwise. And, of course, we have to realize that things went the way they did because of the factors that were connected, of course, to the specific characteristics of, of, of how the Kingdom of France was, was essentially emerging. It's monarchy. It's monarchy. We're talking about a monarchy and a dynasty. This is the centrality of it. Right, and the Kingdom of France has always embodied and it was something that dated back to, to the Merovingians, right? As properly as a as the mystics, uh, uh, the mystic of Mark. And properly blood the superiority of blood, right, of a dynasty. And of a essentially a militaristic and imperialistic one in nature, right? Northern French power, properly what we call it 
French and Languedoc, etc. It's always been an imperialistic power. It's always been in, in its deeper nature, and and this this maintain, in fact, its own you know superiority and you know uh, astonishing success in the history of, of Europe. Where you know think about when Louis the uh, the Sun King, you know all Europe has to colonize against France. This has become the, the hegemonic power. And think about Napoleon that takes over basically all of Europe. That That's um, that's France, right? And we often uh, underestimate this, even in beneficial terms, of course, for the, especially the development of a European, um, you know, common, you know, political and mil military uh, aim, right? Even though the same France is often stood in between because of lack of, you know, exact, exactly because of it, its own uh, individualism in, in its own way, but also setting a, an example for, for other European countries that uh, basically as no other have continued doing this, if not the UK in, in their, their own different way. But uh, this, this is a very important model for, I don't know, for Germany or for Italy to pursue uh, also. But historically, of course, these countries were something different and um, I'm not going to discuss this at this point, but it, it's important to to stress. Now, uh, I don't remember where I was coming from now with this thing, but in in general, right, we, we cannot mm, stress enough. We'll make other videos explaining eventually what happened after moving to, in France, right, and to France, right, and, and, out, and as a consequence, outside France itself, right, um, and but we have to to realize that the, the the broader background of this, and also what this battle, as a symbol, fundamentally stands for, right? Because there is been also a lot of fact of mythology, as we were saying, that the same French developed historically about revolving around this moment, um, which is, in my opinion, deserved. In at least uh, there are many, of course, historiographical nuisances, even just the interpretation of the battle, the symbology, the mythology there. Think about the 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 paganizing black dragon surmounted by the imperial eagle, right, brought by Otto of of Brunswick on the battlefield. Uh, this this, of course, also very strong bond of the French monarchy and the French church, which is actually a a common national policy in, in medieval countries in general, but that in France had, even in there, a, a longer tra tradition, a deeper meaning, uh, in a way, as we will see, the same John of England had fundamentally lost, in part, the, the sympathies, both not just of the lay, lay nobility of the barons, etc., but also of the clergy. Uh, and there are naturally also different opinions on you know, there's this different sovereigns and so on, we will we never made a video about them specifically, but they're dr dramatically interesting figures on, on their own. Uh, about what this battle meant from a strictly military point of view, right, The that we discussed on the video about the battle itself, so we will not digress too much on it in a way, but th the the Battle of Bouvines sets the, essentially the, the preeminence the the sanction the, the form, this um, sanction this formalization of of the of feudal system preeminence and its heavy cavalry on the battlefields which is also given for granted sometimes as we think that somewhat cavalry always dominated in the middle ages there was surely um uh, you know this is the, uh, the it's true from a cultural point of view but it's not not always uh, and actually, most of the times, it's not true for, for, for most, in fact, most of the Middle Ages on the battlefields and up to very recent times, right? The, the mid 12th century is the moment in which heavy cavalry really starts being uncontested, right? In the, also in the relatively conventional Western European dimension, but not all, in fact, because this was proven also in the Near East uh, from a strictly military point of view. This was true as again the, the the representation of a broader political and social system that in fact from France was expanding and booming right here the think about even things that were maybe experimented elsewhere like we think that Gothic architecture and art and style came actually rather from England rather than from France. England was factually a French kingdom in everything up to this point, 
right? Um, but it's France that, that develops it to, to the highest level. So the, the huge, immense, uh, magnificent, uh, you know, technologically masterpiece like um, of engineering, of art, architecture, cathedrals, Gothic cathedrals that spread from there in countries never quite seen this thing before. I mean, by this time, Germany was still a wild, right, primitive country. Really, if you see even still how the Romanesque gradually just integrates Gothic, it takes it takes time. It literally, takes the same strength those um, uh, peasants and you know and lords that you know began to clear the country to to expand it further with you know sweat and tears. Uh, let's say um, the same Italy that was kind of more Byzantine influence in, in art, in, in culture, broadly speaking, also absorbed its own type of Gothic, but in different ways. The Iberian Peninsula is also influenced by France in this regard. The feudalism as such is there, we've seen it many times. It was already present as a formula in the Basilatic beneficiary one, at least, let's say, in, in all post carolingian countries. Uh, but it's reinforced dramatically in the 13th century. From there, the French are the same ones that take over Constantinople, that spread further, that take the Kingdom of Naples, that start venturing in 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 the Mediterranean through through Egmo ha having having consolidated uh, their control on Occitania and uh, launching offensives on, on Egypt to wipe it out to reconquer Jerusalem. It's a grand plan. Right, the the French were under Charles of, of Anjou uh, would would go pretty close to retake Constantinople, even when it had already been retaken back by the Palaiologoi in the second half of the 13th century. And it's also the 13th century, the the, the great moment of the collapse of the empire. Right, that that is kind of embodied by by the struggle of uh, the, the same struggle that of the uh, Welfen and the Hohenstaufen in Germany that the same battle of Bouvine settled, right, um, as uh, Otto of Brunswick, as you know, had risen after Philip of Swabia was opposing um, the, the young would-be Frederick the II, right, and, and that's all the consequence that will impact the Kingdom of Germany that will at that point was was undergoing in fact a severe you know re, re let's say uh, uh, settlement let's say and, and that was definitely not in favor of a centralized monarchy that the saint frederick the second basically gives up right essentially starting princely germany per, per se just using private means but because frederick also rules from sicily right and if if uh, you know if the, the Battle of Bouvines had gone in another way, of course, w things would have not changed really in the in the broader German interest to reconnect Germany and Italy, and frankly, to preferably rule from Italy as Otto of Brunswick had done himself, and that's the reason why he had been excommunicated, and you know, you know why the papacy had sided with Frederick II, and was already the French papal alliance in this sense was was going on. And, and the same King of England, preferably oriented in favor of the Welfen because of many reasons, right? Not just familial ties, but also the, the important connection of you know Northern Germany from an economical point of view with England, uh, the Rhineland, the, uh, the North Sea, etc., had kind of importantly bet uh, against, right? You know the the the, the English in this sense um, in in a French alliance. Uh, Frederick II would have not ruled. Um, the that pre-humanistic sap that the Sicilian courtly school that would you know express uh, you, you know it, it's um, you know it, 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 this great feudal courtly culture right in a mix between the the Occitan the Sicilian the German one at the Saint Frederick the Second court and that would have spread in 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 Tuscany in essentially seeding you know, humanism and the, 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 the enormous, the dramatic literary tradition of, of in, in, um, in, you know, of, of the still novel, eventually Dante and all the, what eventually the Italian Renaissance would have exported from, from there on for centuries, uh, would have not quite existed the way we know, right? And this all was decided on the battlefield of Bouvines, 
right? There is a place where there's really not really much. It's like you know these great battlefields. Right? Think about as in Korea, places where there's literally nothing. In that, in which in then in battles. In the case of Bovin, especially not not a big battle, right? There weren't so many. You know, the, the armies were not so large. But the for the time, right? The, the shift that was achieved in that battlefield, the the defeat of Otto's German policy and the, the whole imperial dream, he would die afterwards. And eventually, as we've seen, the, the, the major consequence in England with the Magna Carta and with the Anglicization of the monarchy and the a, a complete redefinition of the political institutional basis on which English rulers now they were cut off fundamentally from from France, important for which they had drawn so 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 many resources would would change everything as much as for France that. Uh, in, at this point, had really risked to be tackled, to be properly, to to, to have seen a, a completely different model of rule. Because if the Capetians had been taken out, as it, it it was about to happen with Richard Lionheart, and in this same occasion, uh, in the Bouvin campaign, um, would have evolved in a still in a much more decentralized way. Right, the centrifugal policy of the various vassals would have taken over. Uh, the English would have had a, a much greater power and capacity of interference, and they would have surely seized the, the crown for themselves. So, albeit a, a, a dynastic s succession slash substitution, probably the, the 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 history of France and England, in terms of properly a ratio of strengths, would have been dramatically different. And the proof of this set of the the this, the French success in this regard would be proven paradoxically in the same hundred years war because it doesn't matter how much and hard the French were defeated in the major engagements of the war. I mean, Crécy, uh, Poitiers, Azincourt were were massive blows, right? If you know, it have they had been taken by any other monarchy, it would have collapsed, right? The French, at the end of the day, managed to win the war and to consolidate. The, the the greatest most function mo most powerful state in Western Europe as a consequence, while England fundamentally would withdraw within itself and actually up to the mid 17th century not quite reachieve the you know the first uh, class status that had uh, up to that point enjoyed like you know a major a major European power in the uh, from the the Norman conquest onwards, so. This is the set, the magnitude of of consequences that that this battle produced. That, of course, at the time could not quite be in, be f foreseen in in the way we do now. Right, the main the main mythological problem that, however, actually highlights when corrected even more the the capacities of of the French monarchy is that there was, in fact, still at. Uh, Philip Augustus' uh, time, not n not really, in fact, a, a necessity or or a, a, a for for the rise of France the way we know it, even even as properly the monarchy and the the state that was eventually developed to to keep together this enormous amount of territories, many of which also had their pre-Grest uh, traditions that were quite different, especially south of the Loire in the Languedoc. Um, from from the the French North and that were eventually taken over uh, and controlled and consolidated and never quite rising once again. You know that you know the connection of the of the same English with 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 Normandy, with Mend, with Poitou, with um, Aquitaine, and so on. So th those were lands that had up to that point enjoyed an autonomy. I'm not talking, of course, there were. Part of these were also north of the Loire, but that's again how actually narrow, extensionally, the royal French power had been up to that point. Um, and and so the the massive state French state building built very contingently, very without uh, you know, uh, uh, and impossibly so for the coercive means of the times and the unpredictability of the system overall, but. Um, as it was built in in France, right through also the the integrated the use of you know the, the cooptation of the the bourgeois element that in France would have also developed in fact the, the modern state as we know the bureaucracy the alliance with the papacy what we were talking about just recently this 
grand plan for, for a broader European scale policy is, is something that was, was, you know, to be done yet, right? So it's as if Bouvin had unlocked all those dramatic moral and material resources that, that the French, that those would have won fundamentally the French crown. Um, we're, we're able to mobilize uh, after that, you know, unitary sense. And there is more than that. These are also kind of superficial interpretations because uh, it would be interesting to go very much in detail. I hope we will do it soon about such such mechanism. But it's important to set the, the, the standards straight. So, as you know, the we'll talk about... Uh, uh, here it's difficult to not to address things in terms of French and English not to make confusion but we should always stress this that at this point the English kingdom was fundamentally a French ruled state right so there is not really a national divide as we intended um, especially because also the the ruling classes are in the feudal elite in this sense and so the military one are are very international in their own kind right since the 10th century when the Knighthood is, is is properly defined also as a as a social class um, that that in this sense is is pan post Carolingian we could say right so that's the same reason why a Norman knight in England was aside from the fact that he had thieves and you know he originally came from uh, from the same France main French mainland could feel like like even in fact a French knight or a even in, as a German knight or as an Italian knight, because it, it was fundamentally part of that, of that, uh, the, the, it was sharing that same status and lifestyle and beliefs with them, right? There is an important, almost priestly character of knighthood that we haven't quite stressed sometimes that, that in, exalted the religious and military superiority, which the same, also, the same mm, uh, monastic military orders were essentially the, the perfect exemplification right and with also a very strong pagan legacy but also you know universal legacy that was in fact shared both by paganism and christianity not in a consequential way but just because that was how people believed such things in the world and that ecclesiastical sources haven't quite explained the way a knight at this point it was normally literate would have done otherwise but you know um this is the moment in which um still the thing was fluidly in fact, across the channel, right? We often forget how how intense the trans-channel relations actually were, right? Historically, think about the the Celts, the Belgians, always crossing from from Britain to Gaul. But think about the same connections with between the Merovingians and the Anglo-Saxons. So let's be honest. Fundamentally, the Anglo-Saxons were at some point some Frankish client states. Um, the of course. Even there is an English mythology of this story too, and that's why also I'm making this prem this second part of the premise because uh, it, it's easy and logical and understandable for from an English or British perspective anyway to to see, let's say, especially the Kingdom of England as something properly different on its own, and this is true. It's the same reason why the Kingdom of England was was born in the first place the, with the features it had, right? So. It's easy to identify the fact that there was a, you know, uh, an English identity that an Anglo-Saxon that, that laid there was that at, at the root of the same, of the same instances of common law that eventually also what we call the Magna Carta uh, premises and the struggle that had already happened from an ideological point of view, a own juridical point of view. There was already a debate on the, those grounds. The Normans hadn't, and why would it, they have been erased completely? Anglo-Saxon administrative tradition customs which were actually very advanced uh, by the time of the conquest um, but this is the problem is that we're talking about feudal Europe right by the, the time the Normans invaded the island and created let's say took over the, the kingdom of England and and literally they had free hand right on, on everything like they, they they literally remade this this thing in part from scratch, right, with in one of the single most radically violent, oppressive and repressive and bloody chapters in the history of medieval Europe, 
right? The, the Norman conquest was uh, was something extremely brutal. The rebellions that followed after were, were cut down, you know, with incredible violence, incredible violence, even for you know medieval standards. So it was a very harsh repression, and there was surely a divide between the French ruling elite and the Anglo-Saxon population at some point. But it's obvious that as always, these things happen. Eventually, things go blend, right? And but this is the point that the elite was not elite much because it was French at that point because by the time of, of the of the uh, English conquest the Normans were purely 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 Western Frankish there was nothing different by any standard from from what what France would become in fact at, at this point in 1214 or ideally uh, like right as a French thing um, but it was much the fact that they were a military class. They were a feudal elite, right? Up to that point, Anglo-Saxon England had been essentially a, let's call it Anglo-Danish England, because that's what fundamentally it had it was by the time of the of the Norman of the Norman conquest um, had different premises, right? The privatization, of course, had taken place also in in the Anglo-Saxon kingdom, that, as you know, was much more kind of we could say, with all the anachronisms entailed, more democratic, right? The fear, the idea of the third was much more still, you know, the the, the hairband before in a let's say free men participative way. By the time of the Norman conquest, actually, the system had degenerated. It was already privatized. The Danish, the, the Vikings, that also were doing the same thing in their own countries, were stro strongly kind of privatiz privatizing this the system. Right, and also towards a more strictly monarchic and kind of quasi feudal direction, right? But not, none of this was at, at the same level of Western France where the thing was pioneered. And, and it's the same reason, even in there, if you want to see it, to, uh, you know, deterministically, which was not, but that's why they're, the Normans wanted Hastings in, in a way. And things could go definitely differently in that way because also the anglo-saxon system after all the anglo-danish one I'd say what was a functional one it had already received important influence from actually from france itself but it's in this moment that you know the cut happens right and the england that we know in a sense from a from a political institutional juridical especially point of view really comes to be Right, much more familiar, much more defined, much more recognized. Because you see, d during the the central decades of the 12th century, uh, struggles matter. Right, war hybridizes dramatically. The the King of France, Louis the Seventh, had already started working very hard to the consolidation of the power of the Capetian monarchy. Right, we will talk about this another time. And um, his son. Philip the Second Augustus, so you know the 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 uh, the winner at Bouvines, 1180, 1223, um, continued right uh, the work, uh, reorganizing the uh, the chancery, the court, so giving a further impulse both to the administr the crown administrative reorganization and the relation between the crown and the mercantile classes importantly enough because also france had a relevant urbanization at this point also in the north uh, it's often uh, underestimated in a sense as well um it, as you know this this um you know th this was evidently a way to uh, to make this th this communities feel privileged and protected Right, the Capetians, as the single, you know, noblest, uh, you know, dynasty in Europe, were, of course, firstly, discriminatory, content, and then, you know, completely r r repelled, by, you know, by by anything that crawled, like you know, walking on foot, like like a commoner would do. Right, the anthropologic quasi-racist fundamentally idea of you know almost quasi-racial superiority of the nobility it was born there it was a thing that existed ever since uh, you know nobility existed right in, in the 
in the steppes and have taken over this sedentary population, the, the, the tonic uh, uh, element, right, or pre-existing, you know, the, 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 the great Indo-European migration, all the, the, this idea that, yeah, the, 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 the peasant, the, the, the person who has not individual quality and that does not command, right, is, is an inferior being, right, so, but the French kings were well aware of the dramatic, as we've seen, demographic and agricultural potential of their country, so they understood also to counter the same nobility that was preventing, very you know, being very jealous of their own prerogatives, the expansion of royal prerogatives, royal control and power, to support, in fact, the commoners, to support the, you know, the towns, the, the cities proper, right? Um, that uh, in northeast France were also importantly connected with Flanders, with the Champagne fairs that were booming at the time, the, the, the income that this meant. So it was also important from a military point of view. Contrarily wise to, to the common stereotype, there had been nobody in, in medieval Europe who knew better the effectiveness of, of infantry, even the, the commonal ones, um, then the, the the highest nobility, right? The, the men that were commanding it, right, and were forcing it to, you know, to to, to join, to, to fight, to to be, you know, to 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 command it properly on the battlefields, and testing their potential. As at this point, in support of of cavalry, these areas in northern France had had a, a long history of, you know, subordination of um, uh, the you know, of, of the of the commoners, of, of the freemen, let's say, you know, it was something that existed since, you can argue even even since, maybe in the north of France, not so much, but even since pre-Roman times, because the already Gallic society was evolving towards a quasi-feudal one, right, with the, the peasant and the freemen who were just serfs fundamentally, and the, the, also this kind of elite was also pretty obsessed with horses, etc., was, was already rising. The Romans, with their latifundia, increased dramatically the thing in the Gallo-Roman society was already like that at the time of the Frankish invasion the Franks simply dynastically in framed themselves like that and you know bringing down the, their own same freemen within the system so you can argue that these were regions where uh, there was probably even a tradition of you know of 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 um, of of the commoners' inferiority in a much different way than you could find, I don't know, in, in other fringe areas of Europe where still there was kind of even, maybe at this time, you know, very few areas, like it's still a tribal mentality, but still, I don't know, Germany was different. Germany still had this kind of an idea that feudalism was spreading dramatically in there, especially at this point since Frederick Barbarossa's times, etc. But still the idea of the, we were talking about it recently, of the, of the community, of the, that was kind of leaving autonomously and still armed and dangerous, right? And, and still, by this point, in fact, as we will see, we will see at the same Battle of Bouvines with the Flemish uh, infantry that, you know, was, was they fought to the death, right? So prefiguring what would, would happen dramatically also against the same French at, at, at the aforementioned Courtrai, which was something, the, the same infantry, the same commoners, this... These communal realities were becoming richer, and sometimes, you know, were escaping the feudal, uh, the feudal control in more peripheral. They were becoming more powerful. They were becoming more, you know, capable properly of fielding moral and material strength on the battlefields. Think about the Italian city-states. Think about um, so, it, but the same, you know, the the the, the same France maybe couldn't offer. It was not the best country in that regard because it's the, the one in which. In fact, cavalry was at the top, right? But n don't underestimate the importance of infantry, independently on, from from the from what the sources tell us, because some of the the greatest uh, battles fought um, at the Battle of Bouvines. In fact, itself, infantry does play a role, exactly in the French center, sheltering the initial German uh, charge, uh, right? And you know, the same Philip was behind their infantry, so there, there, is, there is an important political relevance of this, which is not to be given for granted either, right? It was also a political project, right? But many other battles in, in the 13th century, including some where the same French cavalry, you know, appeared importantly, such as uh, Benevent or T Tagliacozzo, or, but in other countries as well, such as Markfeld. Uh, we know infantry was there, but the battle accounts do not even talk about them, right? And surely they weren't there for no reason. 
and yes, they were a fighting force. Um, and and it was necessary for the Kingdom of France to expand also in this in these places, in these cities. Uh, the French bishops were also very powerful, so backing the commoners in their cities was a way also to establish to, to curb partly their power, and extending royal power. This is a typical means that were used, even though again the Saint Capetians would have you know they thought that that a the commoners were fundamentally subhuman beings. And so for Philip the Second was priority to resolve. However, first of all, aside from this, let's call them domestic problems, opposed to these ones that are still domestic, but you know, still connected to the international situation, to solve the problem constituted by the objective fact that the King of England, so Duke of Normandy from the, the 9th century, Count of Anjou and of Men, um, because he belonged to the, um, to the Plantagenets, Right, the 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 fief uh, holders of those lands, and also Duke of Aquitaine of, and Gascony, uh, and even Count of Poitou, uh, as heir of Eleanor of Aquitaine, that had brought that in dowry after having actually been married with the same um, Louis the Seventh, and as you know, eventually marrying with Henry the Second, and you know, went to their children as Richard and John also Arthur initially, that uh, were, you know, in that sense, embodying, even, even biologically, even, uh, let's say, genetically, the continuity of those mm, uh, southern, western French uh, traditions that were opposed to the, central, the, the French centralization in France, right? Even as, as they were English, uh, at least kings. Um, they, the, well, the, the king of England was effective lord of great part of the French territory, much larger than the King of France is one, also because it was extensionally larger than, you know, it was the majority of France, right, it covered the majority of France, and to the King of England looked, uh, looked up, say, all those, um, looked up to all those aristocrats that in a way or in another intended to carry out an autonomous policy uh, from from their French king. So it was a deep. That, that's why I stress the 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 political and moral impact of of this victory. Because again, and and that's why I stress the fact that the odds were very balanced, if not actually shifted in favor of the same Plantagenets. So, in, in England, the king of Henry II had posed an end to the troubles, to the revolts. You know, he, as you know, he was a great king. Uh, that, however, resumed, as it often happens, when you know, these great willing figures, etc., disappear at the, his death in 1189. And the situation went deteriorating further with his uh, sons and successors, um, you know, Richard, Richard Lionheart, 1189-1199, and John, known as, you know, the two, Lionheart and Lackland, respectively, uh, but they weren't quite, you know, that, that's not how perhaps they would have liked to, to pass you know, to, to history, let's say. John eleven ninety nine twelve sixteen. Um, these were I personally admire John. I thought he was actually a good king that he managed actually to maintain his own power even after this massive set of failures. That I will see that were in a sense all his fault definitely, but not again in the way you know just because you fail it's you know because you're an idiot. Right, you you're not m more intelligent or more capable than an English king of the 12th, 13th century. I can assure. You. Um, Richard, as you know, had quite of a you know. As far as I know, there is a joke in England for saying that Richard was the most loved of all English kings because he was the one that stayed the least in England. <laughs> as you know, 1189 is not just a random date. Uh, as that's one also the, the Third Crusade, 
you know, uh, Richard exploit in, in the Holy Land and so on. And the, 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 the great problems, actually, that eventually he was kidnapped by in Austria and it was used like a credit card for you to be passed from monarchy to, to, to monarchy. While his mother was, you know, as the energetic and strong woman, she was, she was, you know, doing, working like, like hell in order to, to, to get her, her son back. So the, the same brothers had actually re repeatedly rebelled to Henry uh, during his own reign. Right, because it, this was just, um, I would say, normal for the time in a sense, given the, still, the, the doesn't matter how unitary and the, the Kingdom of England in many ways already was, but of course the baronial struggles, the, you know, the, 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 the instability that is typical of feudal monarchies at this point in history, well, would bring to, to these uh, individuals to ride the waves of rebellions of political and and they were, they also didn't quite like each other. I mean, at least they 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 had, they had been opposed. They were, you know, quite um, quite uh, sentimental characters. Like they 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 were, uh, you know, they they were also living in a different situation. Of course, it had produced itself and they had contributed to produce. But compared to their father, so some say, you know, that they didn't have the same political ability. In any case, this is not important now, we'll see it on another occasion. Um, Richard had, you know, what was remembered in a sense for his nickname, for this fanatic bravery that was also criticized at the time by the same Saladin, for example. Um, he was a, you know, m cruel military leader and some, you know, criticized his capacity. I believe he actually had a was capable and competent. What, what we try, what we, what's difficult to understand for us is what that lifestyle entailed, and what what is that, you know, still the individual played uh, in in the role of leader of men, um, as as a single knight, as individual knight, right? The in individualism of Frankish warfare was still there, was still connaturated to the 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 same impulsivity and bravery, and but. You know, understanding uh, when to charge at at the Battle of Arsuf and where to launch it, and having you know, if you don't have cold blood and intelligence and charisma, you you can't really don't go anywhere, right? Richard had participated to the Third Crusade in 1189, 1192, and after this, he had found himself king for for his father' death, was hadn't you know was still alive when he left, but also he had had to, to, to tame uh, a feudal revolt, at the end of which John had posed himself. Um, and however, John succeeded his brother who died famously, you know, in a, in a quite tri trivial way, you know, in, during a siege actually playing with a, with a, with a boy that was on the castle was throwing, you know, bolts at him and he was just, you know, showing off Try to, to you know to parry that, and then eventually he got wounded, and he that went. It was not even particularly bad thing, but he, he hid it for a time. It went in septicemia, and as you know, most of those times, you know, chances that there was no way to to cope with that. He died. His mother reached him on his deathbed, and so on. The, the boy was quartered, alleged, but but it was just. Um, you know, objectively, a kind of a bad way to, to to die. It was pretty common. That that shows exemplifies actually what, what why also these knights were all obsessed by pitched battles and why they would prefer to to kill to go kill themselves there because most of the the the, the most likely way to die was just to die in your own diarrhea in, in a ditch somewhere just while you were rotting from the within. Right, so being transpassed by a lax in the you know in the heat of a battle where everybody, all the great nobility uh, of the time was present, was a much better way. Um, which, and there was John. John resumed, um, in a sense, his his father's his brother's policy in a grand scale against France. Right, and this was was a sensible thing to do. Some say he was reckless because he basically 
made such a great effort to to go against basically every element in the kingdom. That is the lay nobility, the ecclesiastical ecclesiastical hierarchies, and in fact he arrived up to the point of um, confiscating ecclesiastical property up to the point of being excommunicated by Pope Innocent III. And let's remember that the papacy at this point in history was the, the strongest uh, ever. Uh, Innocent III embodied that point. In fact, it, basically every single uh, country in Europe was formally a vassal of Rome. And in this case, uh, as we will see, the Saint John, after Bovin reconciled with the papacy, he was he accepted vassalage in this sense. He was being a bit rebellious, but that that was in a sense also a price to pay in order to pursue his French policy. Right, he needed money more than else. The English had already understood in the sense the importance of mercenaries. The Saint Philip II eventually, you know, how things went on after Bovin was the Albigensian Crusade. That was a great opportunity for the same French to actually, the French king to send his nobles with free hand in the south of France to commit the, the worst kind of atrocities uh, against people who frankly kind of even deserved them because don't think that the, the Qatars were any, you know, uh, upstanding model of virtue or morality, right? They, they did the, basically the same things in the same identical way, including a perfect copy of the, the, the Catholic system you know, with the Inquisition, burning at stake, all these things, but with the only difference that they were from a disruptive, Gnostic, uh, you know, heretical side, right, that wasn't surely, you know, to, to the means that are necessary sometimes in civilization, compacting the same civilization and, and cooperating in a, in, a, in a sensible way. While the same French king in the north would, would use mercenaries to to fight against the, uh, the the remains of the English because you know after the, the, the defeat of Bouvin most of of the uh, Plantagenet control on their territories collapsed but still not quite evaporate so that uh, there were sieges important operations to carry out but as you know the, the French kings at that point would recover an enormous amount of land all these lands from the mention and uh, Plantagenet rule would be almost cleared from the entire country. That was done with this other military model that we discussed in multiple videos on medieval mercenaries. And what does that mean? Right, the mercenary is actually not much of a less um, reliable, uh, let's say, serviceman than than a subject. That that's a myth that is often being built, but you know, mercenaries rebel when you're not strong enough to control them. Not because your subjects do not rebel, it's that the same happens, right? The only difference is that mercenaries are professionals. And you also don't want to have, you know, dangerous veterans among your subjects if you want to, to control them further. So that's another idea. But it's important to stress also how the military models and the 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 probably the strategic needs that that informed them were were changing at this point in history and so it's kind of it's almost paradoxical that even before with Bouvin the feudal system had to reach its apex even from a military point of view still uh, it was being undermined by the same let's say by the same necessities of civilization not that the feudal system actually was in feudal you could say feudal civilization, people, because the feudal system is more the, a term used in a socio-economical sense. It already kind of existed, independently of whether you want to call it feudal or whatever. I prefer basilitic beneficiary, but let's say feudalism. Yeah, I, I intend it here as as a sort of you know broader. It's in sense of a feudal monarchy and and actually a feudal state, paradoxically, which sounds even more paradoxical because we think that feudalism is just the decentralization while actually it's really not right nor it makes sense to consider it in this way because nothing that is not centralized actually works right so by a certain margin that always existed and the feudal monarchies were born paradoxically much more because they they were starting to implement this non-feudal ways to con of control but anyhow um so these troubles the excommunication of of john etc 
brought Philip Augustus to exploit the situation, uh, and um, given that the, the English sovereign was facing this trouble, in 1202 he declared him guilty of felony, right, which is in this case the crime of which the uh, you know the the infidel vassal, right, uh, stained himself, and so of course. Uh, John was not just king of England, but vassal of the French king in, 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 the, in his French possessions. So that Philip uh, stripped him formally, at least of all his French thieves. Except Aquitaine, by the way. Now, initially, John didn't back down, right? Um, However, with the capitulation of Rouen, after an important campaign in 1204, he ended up to accept to decay from whichever feudal right on French territory north of the Loire. So, it's actually obvious that in practice, John had actually no intention to abandon those rich lands. The... Um, just a strategic situation and and, and politics, uh, you know, on, on the field and politics at home and internationally had brought to 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 give up at that point at one. Um, these were, as we were saying, also rich, fat lands, right? You know, the northern France is a very bloody kind of, you know, fat, rich, you know, s soil, fertile with the Atlantic current, the the great rivers. Uh, etc. And it's the same reason a bit why the Ile de France was so productive and also maintained, you know, su back supported the, the Capetian expansion in many ways. It's the same, even the clay that, you know, through which, you know, some construct, even the Gothic cathedrals, for example, could, could exist only because of specific stones that existed only in those areas. Um, so the material wealth here is, is really remarkable, and uh, you can imagine also the all the, the strategic advantages of controlling those lands in northern France, being close to the Capetians, also but accessing, you know, the, the southern French territories, uh, you know, on the west bank of the Loire, and, and facilitating all the, the communications, and so on. Also, in a few years, John intervened in the civil war that had broken out again in Germany, for the imperial crown between the heirs of the house of Swabia and the successors of Henry the Lion, with whom he, had, you know, his family was married into famously enough, the, the, um, and for all the the broader, you know, interests that the English had in mostly northern Germany. That was, in fact, at that point, most Saxony, where the house of Belfin and the, you know, the trade with the Anseatic cities that the control of the Rhine uh, axillary traffic, uh, while Swabia was more of a continental, right, alpine area, more, you know, more, you know, from, from the side of Italy, by the way. So a, a weakening of the Saxons would have, would have brought to, to, to a weakening of, of the English in, uh, as a consequence and supported France that, in fact, not surprisingly, was allied with the Hohenstaufen this point that we're getting the worst of it because Otto the fourth was was elected I made a video on on this on the rise of Otto of Brunswick after the assassination of Philip of Swabia for, for unrelated reasons by the way but still right so this is the the background a bit in which the battle is framed right the the this was an important, you see, uh, a resolutive battle, you could say, you know, the size of, I, I don't like much the term the size of in Clausewitz in terms, because there is nothing fundamentally decisive, uh, if not the last of things, which never is quite the last, right, but, but this was, you know, uh, definitely, uh, as we've seen, uh, an incredibly important clash for its outcome and consequences, the, the, the sheer magnitude of, of the same and all the, the various repercussions all over the continent, which was fought on the Sunday of July the 27th, 1214 at Bouvines, 
this locality north of France, not not much far from Lille. And um, in the in that video about the Battle of Bovin, I, I told a lot of, of anecdotes like uh, that. Of course, as I was saying at the beginning, you know, one must understand them on a, from a literary point of view. You know, philologically, you know, being uh, th there is an image here that is pa painted, a portrait that is is drawn of Philip the Second, who uh, was here. I, I will not resume the, the strategical issues here. There, there, it was it was actually a campaign fought on two fronts. Right, one was north northeast of France, with the uh, essentially with there were English mercenaries, or at least English paid uh, mercenaries that were the, the the most important force and actually a, a a few germans under otto brunswick right there were a very few vassals german vassals who participated to 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 his enterprise because his his um, power in germany was already declining he had already you know that otto had campaigned in sicily had already resumed it had been excommunicated again had resumed this mediterranean policy that was the same one of the Hohenstaufen that every sensible German emperor would have done, but he had actually been backed by the, the side that hoped for more of a kind of continental policy, uh, and or however not the, the the rise in power that you know that he would experience. Uh, the young uh, Frederick II actually showed a massive guts by standing against against uh, Otto Brunswick in Calabria. Uh, as he basically had lost almost everything except Sicily at that point, and so it was that. That's why also the papacy that had initially backed the same Otto not to make the Swabians reconnect actually with the the Sicilian and German and Italian uh, crowns because you know of the uh, we made many videos on on the whole Villa and Orange stuff and succession. Right at that point, he had convinced himself that it was still more important to to back instead the Swabians against Otto, but. Um, Th this grant policy had been too much to sustain from him, and so he had alienated much of the sympathies of his own, of his own vassals. Right, he had a few, a few supporters, mostly, if I remember correctly, from from lands such as Lotharingia that were, Lorraine that were, uh, kind of, uh, you know, in borderline between the empire and France, and that if you know the French had prevailed, would have, you know, would have suffered most from it, so they would back Otto instead. Uh, but there were a few Germans that that in the battle, and that gives a, a dimension of already of the failure of, of 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 Otto that passes naturally as one of the great defeated in history. But uh, probably also was not easy, you know, not in an easy position for sure. Um, the um, the the while the actually John with, with other troops was besieging in another castle in in the in west. Initially, the, he, his dream was to split Philip II and Augustus' forces. This actually happened because it, it was either attacking the Anglo-Germans coming from the east or that were invading, you know, coming close dangerously also to, to the Paris area and so on, or trying to really, uh, release the siege of, you know, of the French castle in the west. And, uh, where, and so he sent actually only 800 knights under his son to cope with John. Uh, and he split forces effectively and d decided to to confront the the Anglo Germans in the east. And um, of course, the there was a broader support of the from from internationally. Frederick II of Swabia, the papacy were for the French, and um, the, the, the 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 Otto of Brunswick was supported not just by John of England, but also by some French feudatories that were, in fact, against against Philip Augustus. And the battle has... Now, we, 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 don't, we won't go in detail. It was fought actually on a single line, split in three sections, and on, on each sector, fundamentally, uh, there was... Um, you know, the, the French essentially won on the right and then kind of overwhelmed... The 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 center where Otto was, and on the on the left we don't know exactly what happened, but you know there were also the Flemish who fought to the death, but you know they were overwhelmed there too. The, the main the main tactical meaning of this battle is to be seen in certain 
um, fi military finesse that, that is displayed by the French and especially under the command of the Hospitalier Knight, a crusader veteran that is Garant de Sangli, who, uh, you know, the Chronicles say, you know, Philip II as a king was in charge, he also performed actually he mass on Sunday himself, so th there is this kind of ideal, you know, superiority of, 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 of holiness of the, of the same monarchic office that is equated to, to one of the clergy, in alliance with the clergy, the, the French were, were very stern, right, they were very harsh, they were, this was exemplified by the Louis de Sament, right, and was very, you know, this has gloomy, heavy, military, martial, but also spiritual way, as opposed to Eleanor of Aquitaine, you know, came from the south of France, where all, you know, courtly love, dances, uh, you know, even promiscuity in that sense. So there are different models here, culturally speaking, that are counterposed. Um, but Guerin de saint louis perhaps, was the actual commander-in-chief of the French army in combat, right, for, you know, for the, the tactical deal. And he operated with a tactics that, that is actually very similar to what the, the same, in fact, the same monastic military orders had been pioneering and refining essentially the top equestrian military culture in the in the east. some say in the east i personally believe that this was just a natural development of feudal warfare that was already happening in western europe for for obvious reasons because there is you know no sense why sh this should have not happened in the first place it would be just a an imitation from the east that i've come to to the bank in so many videos, but not because I have anything ideological. That it does happen, but it doesn't seem to me to be the case. But it's simply the the echelon uh, formation, right? Different, uh, different um, units of, of of knights that are sent in battle in sequence, right? As a calcul say a calculated um, gradual effort of of these reserves uh, to better fact save uh, to make an economy of forces. A preliminary screen of sergeants that literally threw themselves in a suicidal way against the the uh, the, the Anglo Germans to soften up their ranks, knowing that they would have died. This is something that happened actually in uh, in in many uh, from from that moment onwards, especially that is I think kind of the, properly the, the first time we, we see it in Western Europe documented, which doesn't mean that it didn't exist before, because it also it's it's pretty. You know, it, it makes sense at many levels. You know, also, it, it was present in other times in military history. So again, that uh, literally also embodied that feudal promise, loyalty, that idea that the sergeant were also fighting for their their the money, of course, uh, as all you know, this was starting to happen even in the feudal system. As we've seen, the soldiers were more present. Ser military service was paid. It was the great nuisance of the time that, in theory, vassals had to to provide military service because they for free because they had been prepaid by the same thief they entrust them and they control the same thief right eventually this wouldn't happen because of course they entrenched themselves into their their properties and they wouldn't dislodge them so they had to be paid to go to war but anyhow that was also uh, an important aspect of you know disciplinary uh, development and articulation, the idea of sending somebody who knows that is going to, to crash himself, you know, as light cavalry against the heavier one, but still softening up the, the heavier one to, for the your own heavier one that can crash against that. Of course, that depends also on the strength ratio, so it's not just magically happening and winning, right? But that contributed. There is also a, a flank attack during the battle, which, which happened but it does also require some kind of, we don't know whether surprise or not, I remember in the battle video we, we talked about this, but still importantly in the sense that that's a tactics that was spreading, would become kind of very common, if not almost the foe in, in, in 13th century warfare, and never abandoning that, even here to say, yeah, no, th this, came, this comes from the east because the Turks made these things, but, you know, a flank attack you, th does, you know, do you need to f fight against somebody who use flanks attack to understand that you can't flank attack right it doesn't make any sense right did, did anybody would have conceived that right it's just that we see it being done for the first time and this is important because it mostly t tells that there is a tactical refinement that that corresponds to a greater central uh, authority and capacity of collective training and and of control on the battlefield right that you know first of all this big thick 
ranks that just clash against one another. Now there is a tactical articulation. That means simply that doesn't happen because somebody wakes up one day and decides that that that, that simply reflects the articulation of power and how you know can control the various elements in an ever more uh, separate, refined, and cooperative, synergic way. So that is to take consideration as well. Um, as we were saying before, also the, the the resistance. You know, the the Battle of Bovin in this sense sanctions the the superiority of 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 heavy cavalry on the battlefields and its tactical refinements. But at the same time, there, there is the the explode of Flemish infantry, the Flemish mercenaries on foot as pikemen that are basically left by the Anglo-German f uh, the rest of the army and they get themselves killed till the very last right, the, the French have to basically surround them and launch charges and even lose some of their troops to, to take them out this is a prelude to the 13th century Flemish experimentations and eventually the, you know, the Flemish victories in the early 14th century against the same French cavalry but again, it would take that long before it could happen. Um, infantry, as we were saying before, had an importance. At some point, the same the same Philip II during the battle is hooked by you know enemy pole arms. He's, he's, he's taken. Is literally like they, they were pulling him from one side and some from from the others to get it back, right? You know, so a uh, dramatic situation. It tells you how much even kings were directly involved still in a. In, and so how primitive, in a sense, warfare still was by that time, but seeing this transition occurring for which the king could and had to risk his own life to to provide that moral force, that inspiration to the troops to, 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 to prove that that was a, a holy code, that it was the right cause, that it was a, something greater for which they were f fighting. And ideologically speaking, and considering the development of French market, is very important because ideologies are stressed very much exactly when you you don't have many other means to to make things work in a safer way right so it was a great form and the victory signified for philip augustus the possibility to launch um let's say in perspective a unitary policy that sub finally subordinating to the french crown the feudal forces and preventing them to see uh, to look at beyond the, the frontiers of the reign in search of external support for their centrifugal policy, Wh and that and that's th possibly the main, you know, the the the, the most important element of which that the moral consequences of this battle lay, because it it basically showed that that the effort, the enormous effort, by the way, with the, the mercenaries, this exp the, this this campaign, the John's campaign in, 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 in France here on the two fronts, etc., the old international mechanisms, the pay for the mercenaries, etc., was extremely costly, was enormous. That's why eventually, you know, the Magna Carta and everything, because, you know, it was not just a, a complete failure, but at the end of the day, it, it had costed that much. It, the, 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 all the, the, the barons, the clergy, had, had, had to pay for that. So how to cope with that? And so the, the, the balance, the political balance had turned and and lots of things would change in the same England that again also lost dramatically so many French territories and this brought to a sort of properly by anglicization further of of the same kingdom of England and its monarchy but properly the idea that in France there was an authority that was capable of controlling with this devastating military capacity at that point that increased so um, after the the victory and the loss of the, the various Plantagenet strongholds, were let's say w was was a way to properly make all these rebel autonomous feudatories um, realizing that there was no other much of another option, right? Also because many of these feudatories had actually supported the same same English as they didn't quite have by themselves the same force to withstand the French on the right. That, that is, it was either them or the French king, right? Um, it's important to stress how much also the Capetians and their branches had developed this, this properly militaristic 
policy for which their their, dynas their dynastic prerogatives went in parallel with enormous uh, endowments uh, of land this further you know essentially con some of the summing of, of, of the various assets in, in the hands of fewer right you know try we, even with the force to that would came a bit later but still not to divide every time the equal in equal amounts that the, the inheritance to to have some um thieves that properly were being starting to we've seen it with the Dutch of of of, uh, of Burgundy in the video we made uh, a couple of months ago uh, to to start administering these states yes as private possessions but within th those boundaries as kind of states on their own Burgundy being the properly the great example but also the Ile de France as from from Paris when the Capetians ruled is also kind of that so this were forces that had a much greater political weight right it could shift the balance when concentrated on single other entities that weren't as strongly um let's say uh con consolidated right this, this is important to stress that also had it had been difficult to dislodge the, the plantagenets in a sense because they the, the title would be maintained the anjou were passing to be, to be uh, eventually the same, same branch of the Cap but Capetians, right, in, in terms of who, you know, whom got the, the, the thief in the end, but um, because those were, had a greater power, but if you look especially at the south of France, feudalism wasn't as developed as in the north, so it was richer in a sense, more uh, vibrant from a cultural point of view, as we've seen before, but not as, as capable of, of 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 um, strategically as as the north, right? And this is what they would have learned the hard way when confronted with the uh, the crusaders and uh, their 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 might and the, the 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 support from the French king and and the the, the papacy and you know and so this went in parallel also importantly from from an international point, right? It was important for the papacy from there on, for example, to have a strong France to oppose the empire. So it was also they are broad convenient to uh, convenience to to facilitate the spread of the Fr of French power in the way it did so significantly and so uh, these are all broader implications we'll see sometimes but let's say I hope um, that that this video was enough to at least explain the how eventually the ideology the mystic of monarchy and the uh, Eventually, the, the success of the same French state occurred in the 13th century because of the concrete proof that this system had worked. It had worked on the field, and Bouvin had proven that. It had worked on the right on the level properly of the um, of the of, of wanting to go out it and risking it again. The uh, a defeated Bouvin would have had in enormous consequences um, for the French in the same way, right? The the Capetians would have lost their crown. There, there is like, do you understand the, the the magnitude of the consequence in European history overall? Um, it would have been a completely different situation, and who knows what we would have seen? But it's it's still, um, you know, having split forces having decided to meet the enemy on the battlefield and having done even with those sudden movements before the battle where the, the French were crossing already a river and then they, they came back they decided in a few minutes almost to 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 turn and, and fight again that this are all um, deep that they the, the way they managed the thing and the battle and all these things they reveal how much used to command the strategic thinking and 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 uh, properly unit of command the the French system already was right so that's what it, it, it made it made it win right oh, the, the loyal French vassals that were at that point the, the top cavalry in the world not that the English were were less actually in, in in that sense as we've seen the word the same thing but the French had were the ones that had created the thing back in the day were were that model had been framed from an earlier time within the idea 
of a dynastic monarchy, right? And, and in this sense, the Kingdom of England didn't quite have the same idea of it. Because the Kingdom of England had been created, yes, as a private possession, supported by the papacy, like in a crusade. Um, and yes, it had been, uh, you know, as we've seen, England had been Normanized, but not quite in the way that um, uh, exactly in order to escape the decentralization of feudalism that had made the Capetians struggle against the same Plantagenet um, in this case, uh, the Normans originally had decided, like in Sicily, to given that nor England nor, nor Sicily were, were feudal uh, lands, because they, the Anglo-Saxons and the Arabs didn't have that, right? they could build a, a more equilibrated feudal uh, monarchy, right, with much more participation of some other elements of, uh, let's say, of, of the community that would check the, the individual baronial power. In France, it was, it was, it was not possible to do that because uh, the, the kingdom had literally been born out of that same privatization and the entrenchments of no nobles there. These nobles were exactly because of that entrenchment more, um, more used to understand perhaps the the benefits of a that a larger command when possible right because for, otherwise they, they were very jealous of their own prerogatives and their own seigniory within their own fiefs but such a huge opportunity like the one of you know that opened after Bouvine for themselves because they were co-opted still by the monarchy because the, the, the nobility was always there to exploit such situations was from properly from a strategic culture from a strategic perspective from the idea that um, charging on a battlefield against the enemy at 45 kilometers per hour crashing against that somebody else who's coming at the same speed against you is is what at the end of the day the entire life revolves around right and therefore that's their function it, that's a chance that they cannot miss for for expand for being rewarded eventually right morally and materially and spiritually in in the in, in the process right and maybe this is a m too much of an ideological interpretation but um it's it, it's very different from uh, a trans maritime policy just like the one of john of england in this in as the same bovine showed um and that it was essentially bringing war in the same in the same lands where most of the same English, allegedly English, let's say, uh, feudatories that were factually French, actually uh, resided. And in fact, during the the siege, um, during the the campaign, etc., where they had tried to lure uh, the French, uh, at some point, the, the the English barons began to say, "We don't want to fight here anymore. We don't see the point. We don't see why." you as a monarch would eventually strengthen yourself by bringing war in the same places where we have we have our interests and say yes we should defend them from the the, Fr the french king equally but you know also in england this has brought for you to, to spend an enormous amount of money that that we don't want to pay for right that we don't want to that we want to have at least more control on which is what well, in England, in fact, the, ki the king had had more than the French one, so it was a different political balance. That paradoxically, would bring in that sense to to make of England an even more unitarily compacted country because of the of the loss of the same French uh, lands, right? And and having, as we've seen, entrusted, you know, the main operations actually to mercenaries somebody that w were at the direct dependence of the king and not as barons that were to be summoned just by, you know, you had to ask them. So, so it's a very complex political situation that is not easy to just re, re you know, express here so so simply. But um, that that shows from, from the Plantagenet side the, let's say, if you want the inconvenience of having to cope with two countries at a time, Right, and for for the kings of France, this, this was, uh, albeit the, 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 in spite of the difficulty to expand and to, you know, to try to, to make their way through this uh, woods of you know of, of feudatories would oppose themselves, were more convincing, in an imperialistic sense, in a, in, a, in a sense that you know we're saying to these feudatories, you can't just 
he would just uh, release them in the south of France, say, you know, that way is open, go there, grab what you want, right? So that is also the, the opportunities that this kingdom had, the, the pre-grest um, monarchic and, and sacral nature of this country from even the imperial legacy that had been of the Carolingians, that it doesn't matter if the Holy Roman Empire was the actual empire in a way, but the French were reasoning still culturally in a very similar way, independently from the different institutional structure. And it would prove that, because they created enormous power that would supplant the same Holy Roman Empire as the first power in Europe at that point, while the, the other, in fact, was, was also further declining on its own. So we will see this better hopefully soon in another video that explains that French expansion. For now, however, we stop it here. I just hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it. Otherwise, leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content. And for now, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time. Bye.